Today at the National Press Club, former Australian of the Year and leading burn specialist Fiona Wood. The 2022 Australian Society for Medical Research Medalist will be speaking on the lifelong impact of acute trauma. Professor Wood with today's National Press Club address. Hello everybody and welcome to today's National Press Club Westpac uh, lunch. Today's speaker is Dr Fiona Wood, AM, and she's also today's ASMR medalist. Uh, you can follow us on social media at Press Club Australia. Uh, we look forward to this speech and welcome to the stage. We look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who has brought me to this point uh, to be the ASR medalist for 2022. It's a lot of people have helped me along my journey. I'm humbled and absolutely honored uh, that people have put faith in me such that I feel I have to work even harder to justify it. And certainly for me, I'm given this opportunity to speak with you today about my journey and my ideas on how we can tackle the future of something that is so exciting and something that I'm so passionate about. And so let's just reflect. We're all here face to face. It is absolutely wonderful not to see somebody on a screen. <laughs> Although many people do see me on a screen right now, but anyway. And so it is wonderful to be here. And we are here because of that frontline clinicians across this country holding the fort, provided by the, the science and technology, the population health information, the data analytics, all that information, that science, by our medical researchers in, across a whole range of fields, providing that information to our whole community. We have been in this together, absolutely no doubt. And by being in this together, we've given our community the opportunity to be part of the conversation, which I think is fundamental going forward. It takes me back, actually. 20 years ago, I think Australia, certainly I changed. The window to my world was opened at the time of the Bali bombing in October of 20, uh, 2002. And I saw people doing so many things, so much positive energy coming out of what was so profoundly negative. I saw clinicians like myself holding the front line in intensive care, in the emergency department, in aeromedical evacuation, our blood bank, our pathologists, providing us information so that we could care for the patient, our pharmaceutical companies providing the drugs, the fluid resuscitation, the nutrition. And then I found out the community around us I've never been so well fed. <laughs> uh, bringing in uh, all things that we might need and looking after the loved ones of those whose loved ones had been caught up in such a terrible event in Bali all those years ago. And I saw that up groundswell from our community going further. In Melbourne, the MCG was filled at a cricket game and the, the proceeds from that went to help those who were suffering the aftermath of the tsunami a couple of years later. So when I say we're in this together, this medical research malarkey, this health, re, this health system, we are. It could be any one of us. And I see people whose lives are changed in an instant. And it can be devastating. I'm a card-carrying plastic and reconstructive surgeon and I've spent my life treating people with burns and significant skin loss and scarring. And I can tell you, it changes you forever. And I can tell you that it'll change you less now, 30 years on, 40 years on, than it did all those years ago. And so 
as you've heard from Tony, I work across the whole pipeline of this, the medical research, but even beyond that into basic science, trying to understand who out there has got a piece of the jigsaw that I want to bring to bear to reduce the suffering of that person that's in front of me. As I stand there and watch what we can do today, as a result of all the science and technology, it is only a platform for tomorrow. It is learning from today to make sure tomorrow is better has driven me for many decades. What I see is traumatic. I have become to understand that I carry a little bit of vicarious trauma as a result of that, and in no small part for that event 20 years ago. But I've been driven to cope with that by understanding the power of actually changing things into the future, of harnessing science and technology. So where does it start? It starts with children. And so when I talk about being involved in the continuum, we started very early on understanding that every intervention from the point of injury will influence the scar one for life. So where do we start? Any one of you can change somebody's life. You will be able to in three minutes when I've told you how. Because first aid matters. Yeah? And so we, we go into schools. We've built literature, Ben and Bella superhero books, so we take them into schools. We, we engage and s with our community so that they're empowered to do the right thing, as you will be in a few minutes. If you see a cup of coffee going down a child in, a coffee in the, uh, at the weekend, you remove the clothes. If the skin comes with it, it was always going to you have done no harm. But removing the clothes is important. And then cooling the burn wound. Clean, cool running water between 15 and 18 degrees for 20 minutes within the first hour will change a life. I know that. I know that because of the science done by teams in, the, in Queensland and in New South Wales that is internationally recognised. I know that because we, it's not just about changing the heat profile, it's changing the cell biology underneath. I know that every one of you now can change a life. Because by administering first aid, you will reduce the need for surgery, reduce the infection, and reduce the scar worn for life. So many, many years ago, I was training as a plastic surgeon when I met a young boy who was extraordinarily disfigured by his uh, scald injury. And I thought, my goodness, can't we do better than that? At the time, I was working in East Grinstead, which is a very renowned burns unit in the south of England. It's renowned because of, it's the home of the guinea pig club, where Second World War Air Force personnel were collected together by Sir Archibald Mackindoe, and they were rebuilt by this very talented plastic surgeon. And so things moved forward. And as I started in my training, I was taught the craft the surgical craft, the art of surgery, based on the evidence where we can find it, the experience of those who'd gone before, building on the shoulders of giants who'd gone before. But as I was going forward, I could see that those with, with burn wounds that were significant in the surface area, where could we get the skin from to cover that? And I saw in Boston, that they were growing skin. Those were in the days where we had to wait three to six months for the journal to come through the letterbox. You know, it was before all this instant gratification these days. And so where, where we're so inundated with uh, papers written about growing skin on a daily basis, it is overwhelming. And so looking at this, I thought, yes, we've got to have thinking, uh, an ability to think differently, to understand that today isn't as good as it gets, not as a criticism of today, but a foundation for the learning. And so, moving forward, as I came to Perth, I came to Western Australia, and I've, uh, I always think, think myself very fortunate because I met a West Australian, and it was non-negotiable. I married him, I lived in Perth, and I'm very grateful for that because it has uh, been an extraordinary place for me to thrive and for my family to thrive also, and also to connect and thrive in this environment and this microcosm of medical research and build what we could and then launch it into the rest of the world. So the Clooney's Ross Award was for our innovation of Marie Stoner, the medical scientist I was working with at the time and myself, for developing a point of care medical device 
that harvested skin from a non-injured area to facilitate wound healing. It's not used in, in isolation all the time. It's used to augment our traditional therapies also. But we could do this at the bedside within 20 to 30 minutes. It changed the paradigm. It gave us an opportunity to match skin from the sole of the hand to the uh, sole of the foot to the palm of the hand, to match the colour of the face using skin from behind the ear and so on. Because we could take small donor sites and use it to get a 1 to 80 expansion ratio. We'd done the basic science in the laboratory that uh, was funded by Telethon in 1993. I'd met Marie in the bone marrow laboratory prior to that when I was harvesting the skin cells ready for clinical use that had come from Melbourne. We would send skin to Melbourne and it would come back for our first 12 cases until we got that preliminary data. And many scientists around will know that value of the preliminary data, you get that, then you can start to ask people for things. Your idea is no longer floating free. You've kind of got an angle on it, you've got a bit of an anchor. You've got some data that will show that in fact, this is worth doing, this is worth pursuing on a, a larger scale. And that larger scale takes resource. Human resource, human intellect, capital, as well as the environment, as well as the equipment. And that all clearly adds up to funding. And so getting that preliminary data was so powerful and so important. But we got funded along the way from our community, from corporates around us, because they had an, interesting, an interest in the whole burn scenario. Woodside Petroleum particularly were very supportive of us for a very long time because all the disaster plans across Australia and New Zealand that we used to respond as part of the Bali response were based on work that we'd done with Woodside because they were commissioning their North Ranking A platform, which was a similar configuration to Piper Alpha. Piper Alpha exploded in the late 80s off Aberdeen, the Aberdeen coast, with the largest loss of life of any similar situation. And so by working with corporates, we were able to expand what we were doing. And that work was presented to the Health Minister's Advisory Council in July of 2002. It was accepted in, two, in August of that year. But we never did the disaster exercise. We responded real time in October. So it just illustrates how, when I say we're in this together, it goes across the whole community. because. The corporate entity supporting us meant that we were able to augment what we did in a very solid health system and just put that icing on the cake. But as we go forward with this skin cell story, and I know many of you have stood here and talked about this uh, in 2005, so where are the next chapters? The skin cells that we use are harvested from the engine room of your skin. It's between this waterproof layer of the epidermis and the deeper layer of the dermis. And that engine room of skin gives us the opportunity to seal your surface, to ensure that you're no longer leaky, you no longer have that tr uh, loss of fluid, and you have a barrier to the bacteria coming in. And so we say that epidermis, that waterproof cover, will give you life, will save a life. But what about the quality of the life, the dermis underneath, the other elements of the skin? And so for many years, we worked in collaboration with uh, in colleagues internationally as well as locally, developing an understanding of how to regenerate the capacity of, re of repairing all the layers of the skin. And in 1994, Work done in Boston again in MIT in the form of a substance called Integra became commercially available. We tailored this two-dimensional sheet onto the patient's burn wound. And after three weeks, we peel the, the silicon layer off that. And then we repair the, the outer epidermal layer. There's a new a product called BTM, which was produced in Melbourne and in Adelaide. And it does a similar thing, but it's synthetic, based on some very solid uh, polymer chemistry. But it's a two-dimensional sheet that needs to be tailored to a three-dimensional exquisite shape, that human shape. And so when in 20, 
uh, 18, in April, we were operating on a young four-year-old who had burns full thickness down to his muscle from his chin to his upper thighs and to his elbows. And we were tailoring in order to such that they, this child could move his neck, making sure it was an exquisite apposition. Myself and my colleagues looked at this and we thought, why can't we spray this on? We spray the epidermis on. Why can't we spray this on? So I'd like to uh, tell you that we're heading towards a point of care robotic 3D printed device with the aim of it being first in human next year. With the support of Inventure, uh, a company that built this prototype for us in New South Wales, in Sydney, with help from the University of Wollongong, Gordon Wallace's team, University of Queensland, Curtin University, our University of Western Australia, and Murdoch in Western Australia, bringing together Biotech Horizons and MRFF to translate that piece. And we have a prototype that is printing bioink and cells at the point of care. It is an incredibly challenging space to work in. People can print cells and frameworks on the bench, but then I've still got to take it from the bench and tailor it around. So what I would like to do is cut that out and go straight to the point of care. And as I say, we're able to do that based on the technology and basic science that have got us to that point. That's the, that's the end that people are interested. And they're interested because it's exciting, and yes, it is. But there's an awful lot of hard work gone into getting to that point. And that cannot be ignored. And so my last story I would like to tell you is really about another young child I met that changed the way I look, and the way many people look at burns around the world. An eight-year-old had an 80% body surface area burn injury, and we thought we'd done a grand job. He healed beautifully. He sent us postcards riding horses and back on outdoor ed camp at school, only to die as an 11-year-old with a rare cancer. I was told that that was a coincidence and bad luck. There is no such thing as coincidence and bad luck in science. There is data, and you have to really scour the, your intellect and the intellect of everybody around you. Collaboration is key, finding people who can help you answer that question. And so I tried to answer that question and, and harness the power of data linkage. In Western Australia, data linkage is very strong, as evidenced by the work of Fiona Stanley. So we were able to look at 34,000 patients with 124 comparative people without burn injury. So our 34,000 had burn injury requiring hospitalization. And the 120,000 were compared with respect to age, sex, their geospatial and socioeconomic comparators. And we found, yes, if you have survived a burn injury, you have an impact for life, which influences your risk for cancer, heart disease, and every which way we looked, when we started peeling the onion, we could see in some people, not in everybody by a long way, but in some people, they were vulnerable to life changes that were significant as a result of, in fact, not major burns, just burns that required hospitalization. So it wasn't bad luck. It was difficult to get published, so we linked with uh, Aberdeen, doubled the numbers, strengthened the data. But then we linked with IBM, IBM Drug Discovery, the Watson platform. If it won jeopardy, why can't it answer one simple question? What's the link between burns and cancer? Well, we discovered it wasn't that easy. And that the, even though we were able to change the size of the needle and the haystack with the machine learning and data analytics using their AI platform, we still have a significant needle and a haystack. But where do we find the answer for that? We find that in the basic science. We find that in you know, looking at the single cell sequencing, which is a technique that we couldn't do when I first started. All these newer techniques around the mass spectrometry, understanding chemistry, understanding the building blocks of life will drive us to be able to understand how we can improve the quality of outcome how into the future, how we can identify those that are at risk and therefore develop novel therapeutics. 
And I have uh, been exposed uh, to the teams in the Australian National Phenome Centre and I found a machine there. I'd heard about it. I'd read about it. It's called an eye knife. It's currently being trialled in, uh, it's come out of Imperial College, it's being trialled in London and, and Canada uh, for breast cancer and colon cancer, things like that, so that you can cut through with a, a diathermy, which is a hot knife, which generates smoke, and you can analyse that smoke to give you real-time chemistry to see if you're cutting through a cell that is involved in the cancer or not. So we have done a preliminary work, look, cutting through skin that is normal, that exquisite thing. I could talk about skin until you all turn to dust. <laughs> it is so beautiful. And so they're cutting through normal skin and cutting through the burnt skin. And we can see the profile that is so different, absolutely. But what I want is I want, as I'm working, I want to know what is dead, what is alive, what is salvageable, what will be dead tomorrow. Is it contaminated? We have got a lot of work in front of us, building the library of knowledge of chemistry with our data analytics people so that they can give me uh, that instrument in my hand. It goes, yes or no. And that yes or no and that eye knife is exciting, yes. But it's based on the diathermy, simple technology that I use every day, but it's based on electricity. So what we need that was, you know, gosh, started in Edison's time, yeah? And then we look at the mass spec. Where did that come from? When I first started, you had three mass specs, one at the Menders, one coming back from the Menders, and one that worked if it, we were lucky. And so now that technology is so much more advanced. But we all look at the eye knife and think exciting. But there's a lot of sweat along the way to get to that. So I'd like to leave you with the fact that, if, that we are making progress here in Western Austra in Australia. <laughs> We <laughs> slip there. Uh, Mark will be very happy with me. <laughs> uh, and we are, I think, in a, sitting in a very great space. But we need to, be un to understand and not to be naive to the fact that we are in this together. Because it can happen to any of us. And that's a lot of human energy and intellect that can drive forward such that the Australian health system is one of excellence and is the best in the world into the future. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Wood, thank you so much. That was such an interesting speech and not a note in sight. I'll just point that out. Um, you've done remarkable work and obviously a lot of it has been enabled by government grants, including from the National Health and Medical Research Foundation. Um, but you said on, as we were walking down to lunch that you know, a lot of your money, a lot of your funding comes from personal or private sources, including uh, Lamington Drives and Sausage Sizzles which I find extraordinary. I'm just wondering if you could talk more broadly about the funding system in Australia at the moment for research and what are the risks of Australian IP going offshore simply because we don't have a, you know, a, a fit for purpose funding system in Australia? I think we, we really have to take this seriously. I mean, it, it is, uh, I don't want to be dramatic and say we're at crisis point, but we kind of are. Uh, uh, because I think uh, I can give you examples of my own. For ex uh, one example being the cell-based therapies. We got CE mark and TGA approval in 2002. In order to get uh, FDA approval, we had uh, to fund a much larger clinical trial that was all worked out. And eventually it was done by the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine in the US for 800 20 patients, it was $8 million. We are naive to the quantums that are needed, and then we got FDA approval. So I think there's an element of naivety in, and, and burrowing your head in the sand in that the quantums we need are significant. And so there's no, no, my, no drama in collaborating in that, con in that context and making sure that we can drive that. But we could drive that because we have the base here. Yep. But our base, and my other example, our base right from, was Telethon. Telethon funded the lab in 1993. That's community funding. Yep. 
I was told by, uh, that we, didn't, uh, we wouldn't get off the blocks with competitive funding because surgeons don't really do that. That's a bit changed this, time, this year, sort of in the contemporary city, but because we're all starved. It's not, it doesn't matter whether you're a surgeon or a physician or an allied health specialist, we're all starved equally of the funding I think that we need. But so at that point in time, we went to Rotary Clubs, we went out and we, we made sure we looked after ourselves because we weren't sure anybody else was going to. And so I absolutely applaud any research team that gets out there, rolls their sleeves up and goes and speaks to Lions and Rotary and the Surf Club or whoever it is. But it's, give, it just gives you that connection to the community, that, that inspiration and drive and energy to keep going. It doesn't, doesn't buy you a mass, spe a mass spectrometer. It doesn't buy you an eye knife. Yeah? We need that support. We need to understand, stand back from this and say, right, if it's across the continuum, this is how much we've got, how do, we, how do we lift it, and how do we link with our community and provide structures so that our corporates can support us as well? Why not? We're all beneficiaries of it. Some of their information, some of their science is useful to us and so on. Let's open this up. Let's open the, the discussion up and be innovative on how we fund, but don't walk away and think we've got enough because we've just ticked one box. That's not true. OK, so. thank you. Uh, Misha Schubert. Uh, Professor Wood, Misha Schubert here today as a Vice President of the National Press Club, but also declaring for the record, I'm also CEO of Science and Technology Australia. Thanks for such a terrific speech. Um, I could sense the excitement in the room around all of those frontier pieces of work that you're working on. Uh, one of the great traditions after elections and the swearing in of new ministries is that the public service in Canberra prepares a whole lot of incoming government briefs uh, and advises governments and ministers on what they think they should do uh, in sort of broad priority order. Just wondering if you might have some broad thoughts, some advice from you as a former Australian of the Year and, a, and an established eminent researcher about some of the things that you would like to see happen um, in the months and, and years ahead, uh, advice that you might have for them. That's always dodgy, isn't it, giving people <laughs> advice because it's never taken, right? And so I'll step, back, I'll step back from advice and say, wouldn't it be nice if they... Uh, if, uh, the two parties, the political side and the science, technology, health side would actually get together and be asked what is needed and have a conversation and build a strategy as a result of uh, that mutual conversation and understanding. Uh, but, and I think we, that is important and I absolutely believe that we should be asked as well as we should be gi given the information. It should be a two-way dialogue, and I think that uh, I hope to see in the coming months. Uh, understanding that, yeah, we, yeah, we, we have this reputation for always having the handout. Well, there's a reason for that. Let's actually join hands, and you come bring the two parties together. Yeah, but the other thing is where I would give advice. As I tried to give this in 2005, I tried to give this in 2010, and I'll give it in 2022. I believe that everyone in our country in year 10 should be actually taught first aid. I think there are four messages that everybody in this room should know. How to start the heart, stop the bleeding, secure the airway, and cool the burn. Because if we empower people with knowledge, we will reduce the burden on the health system. And I do believe we need to drive prevention. If we reduced obesity, we would reduce diabetes, we would reduce the burden on the health system. And I think our community is w moving in a way that's with us right now. Let's not waste that opportunity. So that would be where some of my advice would go. Thank you. Nick Stewart. I was going, going to ask if you had any recommendation, any serious recommendations that children should be taught before they left school. But I think you've just answered that, that question. Thank you. Um, the, the second part of my question is, um, I've seen a lot of people here speaking at that stage and they've all been using some sort of, particularly the passionate ones, they've been using some sort of notes or speech 
What is it that makes you able to speak like this from the heart? Why do you feel this is so, so important? Is it something that we're not listening to as Australians? We're, we're too caught up with the, the dynamics of the current political fight, who's, who's up, who's down, that we're missing out on the basic needs that you refer to when you, you say every child needs to know about uh, how to stop burns and how, how to basic medical care? I would say I don't read well uh, because I get passionate because I live this. I live this on a daily basis. I live the fact that I can't sleep at night because I haven't got enough funding for the junior researchers. I live that. And where am I going to get it from? And if I have to come here and talk, then I'll come here and talk. I'll roll my sleeves up I'll, you know, and we'll be baking lamingtons outside. I'm not sure if you saw the stall on your way in. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and so, so I'm passionate about it because I live it and I see it on a daily basis. And I feel I'm a world's greatest optimist. I'm a rabid optimist and I'm very, very positive. And what I see in politics really rips my heart out. Because what I see is intelligent people with integrity spending 80% of their time on the negative or what other people didn't do or did do that was bad. Just acknowledge what they might have done that was good and build on it. I don't want to see, I don't want my kids to listen to, and my grandkids now, to listen to Parliament and listen to people pulling each other down. I want them to listen to people who are leading forward, who are actually going to make a difference to each and every one of us by embracing leadership with integrity and leaving that negative, pessimistic, destructive business behind them. Let's change Australian politics and make it, make it different than the rest of the world by being positive, because positive energy, I don't know, uh, sorry, I'm really going now, I know. <laughs> I don't know what motivates people, but I know it's contagious. So let's actually get some of that contagion going. We know how rapidly it spreads, goodness me. You know, so I think that's why I come here, not, contr not controlled by what I've written down. And I may be stumbling, and I don't care about that. What you get is, is me, Come in here because it's important. It's important because I'm 64. Somebody's going to be looking after me soon. I quite like the best tech, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, so it's important to every one of us. So that's why if I say something out of line and I'm blasted for it in the media, well, so be it. Because, you know, that's the, they can, you can tell the bad news story, but what about the good? And I, my life changed in 2005. And I went looking for good news stories from there on in. And my goodness, I can tell you there are plenty around, lots of them. So let's embrace the good news. And should, should kids have a medi or some form of medical training before they leave school? Well, medical training, that's an interesting one. But, uh, I think first aid training, absolutely. I think we give, we, uh, yeah, our kids drive at 16 without a uh, first aid certificate. Yeah, we put them on the roads. What's happened? Trauma on the roads. But we don't get, empower them on how to deal with that such they, if they have an accident. Absolutely. I think we should drive that. And we should drive it with volunteerism. I think my, in, my, in my mind, we should have people volunteering, working with the providers, but expanding their capacity with volunteers. Because I think the other thing that I, I see around me is when somebody does something for nothing just for the good of doing it for somebody else, that's empowering. And that builds our community. And that builds that individual. Can, can I just ask, you, you mentioned before about positive energy in, um, in politics, but I'm just kind of wondering if you could talk to me about magic and science. Um, just, you know, the role of creativity and serendipity. I mean, you've talked about big data, but can you just maybe just talk about what happens when there is magic happening? Well, I think I'm a great believer in STEAM, you know. We can't tell everybody that if they're interested in arts, they don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's kind of a bit dodgy. Uh, and so I, I, I'm a great believer in, in joining the dots. And often my team say the dots shouldn't be do joined and that I'm just making a jumble. Uh, but I think it's really interesting because there is so much magic out there. And as I said, the data is what the data is. The magic is working out what it means. And working out what it means so that we can then, you might have to park it for, it could be parked for decades. And then some, 
somebody remembers things and then they go back to it. There was a paper in 2003 I read where it said amyloid, the protein for Alzheimer's, is in the skin fibroblasts. And I, that was an itch at the back of my mind. And trying to, every time I came across somebody, including last night, who works in this field, I picked their brains a bit. And we're starting to work and understand why. It's a little, those little bits of, of information out there really bring the magic out in us, I think. We all should actually embrace the magic and try and, and connect to solve the problems. Yeah? Okay. Our next question is from Tim Shaw, but not actually asked by Tim Shaw. So, Ella, please. Ella Hodgman, on behalf of Tim Shaw. Thanks for your speech today, Fiona. Um, what can the federal government do to invest and enhance medical shared experience in burns treatment, particularly in Southeast Asia? I think that's a really interesting question because uh, in a period of time, uh, 20 years ago, we had exchanges and we've done a lot of uh, education and, and support in that space. I'm part of the International Society of Burn Injury and we have a mantra, one world, one uh, quality, of, one standard of burn care. Do we achieve that? No. Do we drive for it? Absolutely, yes. And I think that's part of, of many things, is actually recognising the differences and recognising the need to drive forward. And so there are many uh, of our clinicians across Australia uh, that will go to you know, the Pacific Islands and to, into Indonesia and, and Timor and actually teach and, and New Guinea and teach and build capacity across the whole system, as our American colleagues do in their region as well. So I think there's a lot of work to do in that regard, but it's certainly well on the way and has been actually in fairness for some decades. Thank you. Our next question is from Maurice Riley. Uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you, uh, Professor Wood. Uh, welcome back to the club. Thank you. Uh, I've got two questions, if I may, uh, ah. Julie. Um, firstly, um, I'm really interested in the innovations that are coming in the future, such as iKnife, um, Supercomputers. Uh, what what other sort of advancements do you'll see in technologies that would make this uh, job of yours uh, easier for the profession? I think easier is a, maybe the wrong word. I'm sorry to change your question, <laughs> but to make us better at what we do, maybe <laughs> is a maybe to enhance what we're capable of. And I'm a great believer that there's a lot of technology out there, particularly in this AI space. And AI, uh, you know, needs a lot of energy to put into it. We need to understand uh, governance around, etc., without being so burdensome that we can't actually make pro forward progress. But in my mind, uh, those th the machine learning uh, uh, algorithms could actually offload us cognitive so that we are then able to use what uh, brain space we have rather than doing our basics to actually then drive forward. So I see the, the whole like quantum computing and all that sort of to give us information because so much. When I was at med school, I was told it's Tony, immunology was one lecture. Like, look at that now. God, they've done well for themselves, haven't they? You know? <laughs> and, so, and so we've got this mass, no brain, one single brain can hold all that. So we need capacity to understand that, uh, that we can't work in silos and it breaks that down. But in my mind, it gives us the capacity to actually then use the human brain for what it's really about. And it's thinking about the next steps and thinking about what to do better. So rather than easier, maybe make it harder. <laughs> Well, you're not the first one on that podium to change the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my, my second question is uh, the commercialisation process. Uh, we've seen plenty of gifted people like yourself uh, on this podium where, you know, the, the invention is here, the IP is here, and, and for them to take that process to commercialisation uh, I assume that wasn't a natural process for you. Can you sort of, is, how did you manage that? Can you, and what advice would you have for you know, the next series of you know, Nobel Prize inventors, uh, how they you know, get rewarded uh, ultimately at the end of the day? Lock the doors. We'll be here a while. I bear the scars from this. Uh, uh, you know, I had surgical training. I had no training in commercialisation and IP marketing or anything like that. And in the early days, Marie and I not only uh, designed and built the device, we, uh, 
We assigned our intellectual property to our not-for-profit foundation because our, our focus was on sustainability of our research. So it made, uh, we thought naively that we wouldn't have to sell as many lamingtons because we would have the royalties from the kit uh, in, into the foundation. That's uh, where we started and uh, I'm pleased to say when uh, FDA approval got granted in 2018, uh, the boat came in. And so we were able to uh, realize our dream of uh, a, an element of support from that, uh, that avenue, if you like. But it took from, the, we sprayed cells on in 1995, it was 2018. We set up a not-for-profit foundation. We set up a company that then we managed to offload. And Avita Medical are a very vibrant big company out, out of the US who, dr who drive it, who have all the commercialization uh, processes under them. So it was a very hard journey for a scientist and a surgeon. We, it was easier to build the device than to commercialize it. And I think the focus on commercialization is absolutely admirable and it's essential. Uh, and if we got there in the end. It's, you know, when you're in front of the wave, sometimes it's hard. Cell-based therapies are an emerging area that is quite common now. But 20 years ago, it wasn't quite the, sort of the story. So we were ahead of the curve. But there was, what I would say is, yeah, it's hard. And now there are people in our university who help us. We're, we're just taking through a new um, molecule from a team we work with in Pharmaxis in New South Wales. And we it's focused on unscarring the scar. We did the first in human uh, just before Christmas. And we're now in the clinical trial in Perth. And you know, there are people to help us now. And it's been a lot easier with the university and those people around in that space. But I would also point out that we've gotten a lot better at what we do along the way because we've learned things along the way that we have implemented at the coal face that are not commercial. But those incremental gains make a difference to outcome. That improved outcome makes a difference to the health budget. And it means we don't operate as much or whatever it may be. So don't forget those incremental small things. As we go forward with this drive to commercialization, that big shiny cochlear, you know, fantastic. But look at all the science that's behind that, that's been moved into different areas, that's changed people's lives. Don't forget the small stuff, is uh, what I would say. Because yes, we occasionally get a big win, or a small win. <laughs> cochlear is a big win, we have kind of a small win. But there is a lot of energy along the way that should not be wasted and they should not be un go unacknowledged as well. Thank you. Our next question is from Zara Ford from Canberra Grammar. Hi, Dr Wood. My name is Zara Ford from Canberra Grammar School, and my question is, how has the attention you've received from your research changed your attitude towards your everyday medical practice? Uh, thank you very much for your question. I think that's interesting because I, I went into medicine to do medicine, and I never went into medicine uh, to be Australian of the Year. And I remember we had a, a reunion of maybe 50 people who were Australians of the Year here in Canberra a few years back. And there were two groups of us, like Ian Fraser and Fiona Stanley, my friends in medical research. And, and then there were the people like, you know, Pat Rafter, who's like a serious tennis player, and, and Steve Waugh, you know, and there's the Wolf Sport. And then there's the, I can't remember, the country western singer. Anyway, uh, and so on it goes. And so there's a group of people who, whose part of their remit is to be known, yes? And there's a group of people that, like us, who are not put here to be known. And so I find it personally very challenging. I find the attention awkward. Uh, but I remember when I was made a national living treasure, which is very strange, yeah? I was, <laughs> I was driving along in my people mover because I've got six kids and they're all bouncing around. And, and Fiona Stanley rang me. She said that the two of us had been put on this list. And I had no idea what she was talking about. And I said, like, I really don't know. She said, you haven't looked at your emails yet, have you? We're both living national living treasures. I think, thank God for the living. And, <laughs> and so I rang my husband and I said, the world's gone mad. <laughs> And he said, you've had an opportunity to have your voice heard. Don't waste it. So I think that sums up. Sometimes, however awkward it feels, just get on with it and you know, try and make a difference to people in a way that is positive. So thank you very much thank for you your so question. Much. Um, our next question is from Professor, Professor, sorry about that, Jagadish, who's the new president of the Australian Academy of Science. Well, thank you, Julie. 
congratulations, Fiona, for this wonderful uh, medal and honor, and also wonderful sp uh, speech as well. So you have really shown beautifully how the fundamental or the basic multidisciplinary research can be beneficial to the patients and then the broader community. So how do we able to create these uh, opportunities for the next generation in terms of uh, fun base fundamental research as well as also the multidisciplinary research we can be able to support as a country? I think we need to tell the good news stories, as I've said. I think we need to re uh, celebrate them. And uh, I think we are getting better at that. I mean, I saw some uh, great work in this last uh, few days, the three minute thesis, things like that. Making our science accessible to the broader community gives us an opportunity to express what we're doing in the, in the, across the whole community, which I think is really important to bring that, them with us. So teaching our, our, our young scientists, not just, yeah, there's amazing, uh, sort of lipid profiling and the data analytics around it, but actually how to express that in a way that people go, wow, because it is, it's magic. And it's like, wow. And so I think we have uh, uh, you know, to engage across our continuum uh, and really telling those good news stories. I don't, I don't personally see any, any other way than, uh, and, but we, we sometimes think, oh, it's, it's, so it's a bit of a nuisance to, to speak to the newspapers or whatever. But unless we, as, as uh, clinicians and as scientists, stand up and have our voice heard, it will, the void will be filled with other things. So we, that's part of the responsibility, I think, especially our generation that we bear, to make that space for the youngsters coming through by forging forward with our stories and bringing them to the front and say, look at these young people. How exciting is our future? Good, thank you. Uh, next we have Martin Laverty, uh, Chief Executive of the AMA. Uh, Professor Wood, I'm going to be in a little trouble when I get home this evening because uh, my 10-year-old daughter, when I told her that you were speaking here today, she said, she wants to be you. <laughs> What, what advice do you have to those young women in particular who are considering a career in medicine, particularly given the challenges of a constrained health system, an underfunded public hospital system, and so many of our young doctors are not considering general practice as viable? I think that though there's uh, yeah, loads of questions in there, isn't there? Not general practice, not viable. I think it's fascinating. I, I went to med school and I went into the anatomy class and I was going to be a surgeon. And I think I lack imagination, yeah, because I never thought about doing anything else. But my mates who were GPs, I thought they were the heroes. Because it was interesting to me that they had to know about all sorts, everything. I could dispense with immunology and, you know, and biochemistry, and I could focus on anatomy. And I think, again, it comes to telling the story. If we tell the story that the GP does nothing but refer into a tertiary centre, then why would you? So we have to tell the story about that GP's community connection understanding people in the holistic way so that they know when things are changing and how that is invaluable. And we have to bring that, that sort of the community GP along with us. Primary care and, and sort of hospital care need to be hand in glove. We're, we've been split by the funding. We've been split and split and split as the, as the sort of the juggernaut's gone forward and we're diverging. We need to be brought back together because that would open up opportunities across from GP into uh, the tertiary centres that would actually be ben mutually beneficial and improve outcome, facilitate chronic disease uh, treatment and reduce the economic burden. So when I say uh, to the youngsters, do what you're passionate about, my dad went down the coal mine at uh, 14 and he gave us an education such that when you get up in the morning, you enjoy what you do. I thank my lucky stars every day I get up in the morning and enjoy what I do because I've found my passion and it's finding the passion. And for all those young people out there, there's plenty of passion to go around. But we need to, we need to again, it gets back to this storytelling. We need to them to be aware and exposed to this. So I just wonder when you're going to buy her first pearls. Oh, no, don't start that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question, Astrid Watts. Hi, Fiona. Um, 
I'd like to know, and feel free to do a selfless, shameless plug here, how can the public help with your research? And also, how do we, as the public, help burn victims in everyday life? Well, I'll take the second first. In everyday life, you, you're all uh, adver uh, now can do Burns First Aid. Spreading the Burns First Aid, going on our website, buying the, the first aid books and giving them for Christmas to, uh, to young kids you know. Yeah? Spreading that word, great. But how do you help us? And I'll tell you a, st uh, a story. In 2000, January of 2003, a young boy was on a 16-year-old called Jack. He was uh, helping uh, doing, in a farm. Uh, there was a bushfire. He and his friend got caught up in it. Uh, Josh got 30% body surface area burns and Jack got 90% body surface area burns, often considered uh, non-treatable. But he was fit and healthy and young, and we embarked upon uh, the a path of treatment that uh, was successful uh, to a point in that we all thought we had done the grand job, as it were. And on Friday, he was sitting up eating ice cream, and the last wave of infection came over, and he was unfortunately dead by Monday. Now, his father, his best friend, was the deputy headmaster at the primary school, Marmion Primary School, where Jack had gone. Since that time, the year sevens, he developed a leadership program in the year sevens. And each year, they do things, events through the year for fundraising. And over the last years, we have, they have raised for the burn service of Western Australia well over 100,000, nudging $200,000. Wow. And each year, our team go, and our young scientists go and spread the magic. And they go and tell those kids of what it's like to be a scientist, what it's like to be a nurse, what it's like to be a physio or a doctor. And we try and inspire them. And it's a special relationship that is born out of such a devastating event. And it's part of the healing. It's part of the healing for his family, who I know very well, as you can imagine. And so when I say what you can do, you can do anything you like. And my, my dad said, used to say, you refuse nothing but blows. So we re we'll accept any help. Thank you so much. Our next question is from the audience, Kel Watts. No relation to Astrid, by the way, <laughs> as far as we know. Uh, thank, no, 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 no <laughs> S on mine. Uh, thank you very much, Fiona Wood. I was going to ask just the one question, but um, I might sneak in a very first one, if that's all right. Given your inspirational talk today and you're um, mentioning a new way to do politics, is there any chance you can make an announcement today you'll be running as a Teal Independent in 2025? <laughs> Is that too negative? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the second one, um, so I'm with Wounds Australia today, and there's about 420,000 Australians that suffer from chronic wounds each year. Is there anything you've learnt in the space around burns that can perhaps be applied more broadly um, to chronic wounds and other areas to do with the skin, particularly given its prevalence in aged care facilities and amongst the diabetic community? Absolutely. I think this is a huge problem because, you know, we will get 500 patients admitted to the burns unit each year in the adult hospital, but downstairs in the wound clinic, there are thousands of patients that require help. And, and I mean, it's, it is a, an enormous problem. And so we collaborate with our colleagues in that space, trying to understand things, uh, how we can learn from them as well as them learning from us, where the cell-based therapies can be appropriate. And we've done trials with respect to that with them. Uh, where we can look at things local and how the chemistry of the wound is changed. And one of the, our grants is with RMIT and uh, South Australia and Perth. And we're looking at uh, silk membranes with uh, nanoparticles in diamonds to try and be uh, sensors so we can understand pH changes and temperature changes and all that sort of thing so that we, uh, we can sort of go across the continuum from the acute wounds all into the chronic wounds. But I think when we look at it, we've got to really drive this prevention. And I, I've, I've put very clearly that there's a big change to your whole body when you have a, had a burn. There is similar change to the body after, whilst you're wearing a chronic wound. But that, those changes are also preceding that drive that problem. And so understanding nutrition, understanding prevention of obesity, understanding diabetic control, all these things are opportunities. And we need to empower people to take 
you know, to take the, re the reins of, uh, so that we don't end up in that situation because, of course, the ultimate in that, in that context is amputation. Mm. And uh, at our, uh, our dinner last night, we were discussing you know, the incidence of amputation, which is so devastating uh, to that each and every single person. But what about the cost overall? Well, let's, let's really get back to the prevention table. It may not be as magical as everything else, but we really need to have a very solid seat in that prevention table to really mitigate, because it's much better not to have a wound, a chronic wound, than it is to run through the whole treatment program of trying to use cell-based therapies, trying to get the healing right, and then have to amputate the limb at the end of the day an enormous amount of work we've got to do in this space. And certainly the community is with us on that one. Love it, thank you. So 2025? All oh, right. <laughs> uh, Misha, Misha Schubert. Thank you, Julie. Um, another question, if I may. Um, you, you spoke before, Fiona, about that lying awake at night, worrying about um, how to find enough funding to keep your junior researchers in your teams employed. And there's been a continuing conversation in the last couple of years around that sort of precariousness of the, the early years, particularly in a, in a research career and people establishing themselves. If you had a magic wand, uh, what would you do to try and transform that picture of um, job security and certainty for those people, particularly in those earlier years of, of a research career, to, to give them the conditions in which to thrive? I think this is uh, something where we, we need a number of parties and stakeholders to get to the table. I think there's, uh, there's you know, the universities, we've got the, uni uh, we've got the health system, the universities, the political system, the education system. There's, there's too many people pulling apart and we need to pull together. Yep? Uh, and certainly there are opportunities uh, for funding that we need to harness, whether it be our, our through NH and MRC, whether we go overseas to NIH and things like that and learn from there. Well, but, but we need to understand the quantum and the quantum of funding so that we can give people more than a one-year contract. I work with a scientist, Mark Fear. He's coming up to 50 now. I'm sure he'll be very happy with me telling everybody that. But uh, I've worked with him close on 15 years. He was an Oxford postdoc and uh, is the brain the size of a planet. And two and a half years ago, I sobbed because it was the first time we could give him a contract for five years because we had a Stan Perrin, uh, a, lo a local philanthropy foundation, gave us money for five years. And that's the first time. And this is, so it's not just the youngsters, it's kind of across the whole spectrum. And he's like so sobbing as I sat there. He's going, oh God, get over yourself. I said, oh, I'm so happy. Uh, but yeah, we, we need to understand the quantum that is involved. We don't need to push that away anymore. And we need to say, well, OK, where can we get it from? How can we link uh, with our corporate uh, partners? How can we link with our communities? And how can we link with those who provide uh, the environment of which we operate so that we can have the governance structures to give contracts for more than a year at a time? So it's a big piece of work. But starting talking about it and getting, getting everybody to the same table, I think, is really important. And no, not letting anybody walk away. Because if we walk away now, we'll all suffer. And that's for sure. Thank you. Nick Stewart. You've just described how you feel that you're, you don't have your levers, your hands on the levers to actually make these sort of changes. You're, you're not actually able to access the money to, to get the outcomes that you want. Um, equally, this is the National Press Club. You know, we, we listen to you as the subject matter expert and we listen to the AMA, other, other people who, who really understand things. But there's no guidance to us. After you leave today, you, you know, this, this will be to some extent lost. How is it that you and the AMA and, and uh, how can we get guides from the professions like the medical profession as to what we should be actually aiming for, what the country needs to attempt to achieve in order to move forward? I think take it, it's always you know, very easy to say 
oh, we need X, Y, and Z, yeah? It's easy in an environment like this to say, yeah, you know, and be passionate about it, but you're quite right. Where does the rubber hit the road? And how can we make these things actionable? And what I'd like to see is uh, Mr. Albanese and Mr. Butler coming to ask the AMA, ASAMR, ask, what is it? Ask the universities. I'd like an equal conversation. I don't, I think the, the first step is not the badgering and the handout and the feeling beholden. I think that we've got to try and get that to one side. I'd like them to come and ask us. And, let, and let's help each other. Let's create this positive dialogue. And yes, I know, you know money doesn't grow on trees. But maybe we could grow a bit. That's no, no, yeah, we could grow cells. Hey, you know, it's, but I actually understand that. But there are ways of innovating around governance structures, around funds that can build them. Of that, I know too. So we need to get those, the finance people, into the room as well, and we need to ask them, what is the best thing to do in this with your expertise? So we need to respect people's expertise and ask for it rather than waiting for those with the expertise to break their knuckles red raw knocking on the door. <laughs> Thank you. Um, last question from me. So Tony Abbott's, uh, probably one of his more enduring legacies was the Medical Research Future Fund. It was a big bucket of money and it's really kind of switched up medical research in Australia, but not blue skies research or basic research, more at the translation end. Should they, could you just talk to me about the influence of that fund in directing medical research, how it's influenced your research, and whether, you know, whether it actually has kind of changed the ecosystem in which we work? I think, yes, it, it has changed the ecosystem to a, in a part. It is the, the latter end. It's, you know, it relies upon an enormous amount of sweat, resilience, and passion, and sheer hard work to get to that point, yes? And certainly, we are recipients of this funding in our 3D, printing, 3D printing work. But it does, yeah, so you're quite right. It gives the icing on the cake, and it has done uh, in various areas. I'm not quite sure uh, why the areas are chosen, and, and so I don't have a visibility to that, and I, I'm not sure that we do uh, have that much visibility on how the areas are selected. Uh, but for those who are selected, you know, it's a, a good day. Uh, but uh, we just have to remember that if you want a birthday cake with icing on it, you just can't have the icing, you know? How many times you've got to bake the cake? You know, and then to bake the cake, you've got to have the ingredients. You know, so yes, it's great. It's put icing on the cake, yes. Some cakes somewhere, and it's been positive, yes. But we need to learn from that experience and build it. How do we build it in, quantum, in its quantum? And how do we build it in its spread as well? Thank you. Please, everyone, please thank Professor. Thank you.